Um, hello, um, friends and viewers. Um, this video is uh, a quite a stray from my typical videos. And uh, on my last channel, I um, composed a very long list of sexually harassing males in my life. And um, there has been not one sexually harassing female or lesbian. But um, this is going to be like an, like an add-on. And eventually I will post my other videos that have been backed up. Um, but this is going to go under the title hashtag me too. And since you know, all of the hoopla has come out against Brett Kavanaugh. Um, I realized when I uh, recounted the sexually harassing episodes in my life, there were actually a couple more. Um, uh, I'm going to document two today, and I, I have these um, names of these two men. Um, they're remembered very well. And, um, the reason I'm, um, I'm just focusing on the, the pictures on the wall is because I'm, I'm tired and I just don't really have a, a better image, um, to shoot. And yeah, I'm going to try to focus on what I'm going to say. Now, uh, the first, uh, fellow who I want to expose um, the only, I didn't even know his first name at the, or maybe I did at the time, but long forgotten. This was in the early 1980s, maybe somewhere around 1982 to 1983. And I worked at a restaurant, um, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, it is not there anymore. It hasn't been there for, you know, decades it was a family restaurant, and the name of it was Lotus Inn. And uh, I was a waitress, and, you know, I was in my very early 20s. And Mr. Lee was the owner, and Mrs. Lee, his wife, was the manager. Um, on weekends, they had a breakfast. They had an American breakfast just to keep... Um, their restaurant open and to invite customers. So, on the weekends, um, early uh, Mr. Lee came in to open up, and just he would just sit there and maybe have coffee or read the newspaper. And he was either I think he was a geologist or an engineer or some other uh, f you know form of sciences, and I believe he was a PhD. Anyway, um, I never spoke to him very much. Um, however, um, one day he came up to me and he said he wanted to like brush up his English and he just kind of needed some help with English and he didn't feel like he pronunciated or he understood well. And so he, you know, he politely asked to come over to my apartment um, which was Old Well Apartments. And um, Old Well was quite a nice apartment back in the day. <laughs> but now, um, the, the culture has changed. Um, America has changed. And it is no longer a nice apartment at all. Um, it's very run down, and it's it's really embarrassing. I was kind of ashamed when I went back to visit a couple of years ago. But anyway, so Mr. Lee came um, to my apartment, and he came bearing green tea and some sort of flowers, maybe a, another gift. And um, so he wasn't there very long before his real intent was made known. Um, I asked him what he was having trouble with in English because I consider myself very well-spoken and cultured and 
Um, although, you know, I don't have a PhD by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I, you know, I went to school. I went to, um, to college as long as I possibly could. And I did, um, seek knowledge and, uh, education. So when I asked him what he was having trouble with, he showed me, or he described, or he um, mentioned that the words that he was having trouble with, and they were such long English words that probably no American would even know what they were. So he came bearing a dictionary, from what I recall, and you know, I, I, I honestly, honest to God, I thought. He was sincere, and, you know, he had just kind of a gentle uh, a touch, just kind of maybe on the shoulder, nothing sexual and nothing uh, um, inappropriate. However, his intent was inappropriate. I told him, and I could not help him if those are the kind of words that he had trouble with, and that, I mean, he was far more educated than I was. And um, then he made known what he really wanted out of um, this arrangement. He wanted to come over periodically for some kind of uh, um, either sexual or affection. I think he, I think he, made the excuse that his wife was not affectionate or, you know, some other thing like that. But he was a very cold person. He liked reading the newspaper. Um, he wasn't verbal. He wasn't attentive. He wasn't very welcoming, like at work. He wasn't social. Whereas his wife was very social and very welcoming and very kind. So... He was probably more on the covert, narcissistic scale. So anyway, what he wanted to do was to come over period periodically to my apartment, bringing some kind of gifts that, of his choosing, of course, and to um, receive displays of affection. And... You know, I felt like a fool. I felt so stupid that I would be lured and baited um, for such a situation. And I had utter, the utmost respect for Mrs. Lee. I loved working with her. We had a great working with relationship. And I will say, even though I was probably around 23-ish um, at the time, he was around 30, and he had two small children. But he was very indifferent uh, as an individual. He was cold, um, rarely smiled, um, just didn't look up from his paper in the day. And so I told him in no uncertain terms that I was not interested. And that, you know, the reason why he came over um was uh it was dis discouraging because I really thought he needed help with English. So um that was that and you know no pressure, no nothing more. But it was very telling what happened thereafter. When I would go to work on weekends on and serve breakfast, he came and he sat at his table or his booth, propped open the newspaper and literally ignored me. I mean, ignored me far, far uh, more on a scale of um, avoidance than ever, which I really thought was very offensive. I mean, he could have been bigger. He could have smiled. He could have, you know, said, hey, you know, I was inappropriate. But to totally avoid me and, uh, you know, pretend that nothing happened, sweep everything under the rug. That was very highly offensive to me. 
um, because it did happen. And Mr. Lee, uh, I'm calling out your name now. Um, the other, the other fellow, um, this is very, very bizarre, actually. And I was a little bit older. I was probably 27 by now. Um, in the later part of the 1980s. And I had had some friends that went to Duke University Medical School in the surgical department and in the radiology department. And I briefly dated a guy named Chuck McDonnell. And the interesting thing about Chuck, I really, it was very, very superficial of kind of a dating arrangement. Um, you know, he was very likable, very, very charming. And it, it seemed like a very, very popular guy. Anyway, um, he had an apartment in Durham, North Carolina. And I was over his house, and it was in the daytime. And he, the guy wore a wig, and he was, you know, the same age as me, like 27 or so. Now, it seemed like everybody knew that he wore a wig. It was, you know, it was so obvious, but he was so protective, and he thought that he would be discovered as a person wearing a wig. And at the time, wigs were not very sophisticated, and his head had to be shaved. Um, and I guess there was some kind of, glue, I don't know, tape or glue or, I don't know, something to affix the, the wig. Um, so anyway, I was over at his apartment, and he had this irrational fear and paranoia that I was going to um, tell the whole radiology department at Duke University and the world and whatever that he wore a wig. And there was, you know, so many whispers about his wig because um, it really, it didn't look authentic. It didn't look natural at all. Now, um, he was got to be so fearful in this one particular moment that he he had a one like efficiency or a one bedroom apartment, and I remember it as if it was today. And he was threatened. He was just all of a sudden very threatened. And I was sitting on the floor, and he came up to me. And he bent me kind of in a headlock position. Um, nothing was sexual, but it was very inappropriate and sexually charged according to him. Um, so he had me in a headlock and my neck was bent and I was kind of twisted. Now I am very, I was very small. I mean, I'm guessing I was probably 120 pounds and very short. And he was a good six foot one, I believe maybe even taller. Um, and then I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I was like, you know, in a position where I said, I can't, Chuck, I can't, I can't breathe. And he let up on the, 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 the you know, the chokehold or whatever position. It seemed like he knew what he was doing. It seemed like he might have even done it before. And he got up, he went to his closet, and I... I literally thought he probably had a gun it was going to shoot me but that wasn't the case he went to his closet pulled out a videotape of porn pornography and brought it over to where I was and I was just completely stunned and uh, oh I think he had locked just a door or something to that nature or prevented me from leaving initially. So he got the videotape and he plugged it in his little TV. And he said, quote, you have control over me until I come. And then you won't have anything on me, 
unquote. I was flabbergasted. I had no idea what he was talking about. I had enough fear in me to think of how to, what to do next and how to exit, which I did. Um, I believe he was fully clothed, but he was um, masturbating to this video, this porn video. I ran for the door, and I believe at one point he juggled me back, he pushed me back or something, and perhaps went back to the video. I mean, he was hooked on the video. He was, he just could not break free from the video. It was just so extremely bizarre. Nothing ever happened in my life like that. I finally broke through and left and made it out and... Then at the time, I told a co-worker named Dana. I told um, a fellow in the radiology department and um, a fellow that I had dated before in the thoracic surgical department at Duke University. Now, if I ever had to testify on either of these two fellows' um, inappropriateness, I would certainly do so under oath. Um, I feel like Mr. Lee probably did not sway or detour, um, you know, much after that initial contact with me. And he might have even learned his lesson. Um, he, I don't think that he is um, a problem in society at all. However, with Chuck or Charles McDonald, I do have very strong questions. So when some guy and is in his uh, 20s and has such a strong uh, sexual or violence or um, pornography addiction, um, anger, resentment, aggression, that really worries me. I don't know where either of these men are today, and I moved out of state, so um, anyway, I just, you know, kind of had to finish up my sexual harassment video, and um, I think that's probably coming to the conclusion because I think I recalled maybe 13 or 14, I don't know, I'll have to resort to my written down notes. Um, but, um, yeah, that was very memorable to me, and I know the exact layout of his apartment, and I remember, you know, where the TV was, I remember which part of town it was in, and that's been a long time ago, so, you know, women who have complaints and stories to tell and, um, violent episodes or threats from men. They don't forget those things. So many, many decades later, I remember these um, abuses and insults and harassment. So thank you for listening um, thus far.